So here's a, a, an example of one of the subsets of these plots. And this is a profile of the trees as they existed on that plot in 2012 or so when we collected this data, and a map of where the trees were. And I've taken the two chinkapin logs that were on this small section and sort of stood them up so you can see what they would look like. So this is the stature of these trees compared to the trees that are on the site very recently. The problem is that these trees date to 1957, and these date to 2012. So these trees have 60 extra years of growth. The question is, how do these trees stack up to what was growing on the site then? And what Chris and I decided to do was we take rings and figure out what the diameter of these trees was in 1955, and then project them backwards in growth to what they would have looked like then. The basic question is, well, how do you project the tree backwards in growth? The assumption is that this is a resource allocation problem and you approximate it with an exponential growth. So we knew there'd be an exponential uh, growth uh, curve to describe these and basically has an amplitude and a curvature. So it looks something like this. And our problem is we only have two data points. We know the diameter of the tree today and its height and we know the diameter of the tree when it had no height and it had no diameter. So the question is, how do we get from point A to point B? And all these possible curves, and we'll find out the red one is the one that fits. And the way we found it out was to just assume that, well, this has always been a forest, and these trees were all growing up in a forest, so the diameter distribution we see today, diameter versus height, should approximate what it's always been. So these are the trees the various diameters and heights, and this is sort of the envelope they fit. There's a few that lie below because they've just been decapitated by an ice storm. And uh, the mean to this curve goes right through the middle. So we assume that this is a typical representation of what growing up in this forest is like in terms of height versus diameter. And we can use that to project these trees backwards. So when that's done, this is what we see. This is the forest in 2010. And this is what it looked like back in 1955. And you can see back in 1955, <coughs> the big check events were canopy dominant trees. And they weren't an understory tree, they were canopy dominant. And here's another example 2010 versus 1955. So the conclusion is, was pretty clear to us that. that uh, at the time when blight occurred, Shankapin was as big or bigger than everything else it was growing. Uh, so the other work we had done, uh, and this is kind of a sad story, uh, because uh, a little over a year ago, we had a postdoc who came to our department, and his specialty was studying the mycorrhizal connections of trees. And we all know, uh, anybody who knows anything about trees knows that they have to have a fungal connection to really grow properly. And the fungus occurs in these little nodules that develop in the tips of roots. This is a, what a root will look like to you. And you can just barely see these little knobs. You get a magnifying glass, and this is what they look like. And they're connected to this network of fungal hypha that goes out through the ground. And there's a very important interaction between nutrient supply <coughs> between these fungal roots and uh, hypha and the tree roots. Well, we had a specialist as a postdoc, and we thought, wouldn't it be nice if we got a little funding for him to cover the cost of, of his lab tests to study the fungal associations of, of chinkapin? Uh, we applied to the Chestnut Foundation, and they gave him a couple thousand dollars strictly to cover the cost of his lab tests. And here's, here's Murad uh, ben Hassim ben Hali, a Tunisian native who got his PhD at the University of Toronto uh, doing the root work. Uh, paper was submitted and I've got a copy of it, but uh, Murad went home to visit relatives in Tunisia and died of an undiagnosed heart anomaly that no one knew he had. So he passed away recently, completely unexpectedly. And, uh, but I did get to spend a lot of weekends with Murad and my shovel helping him. And it's not a simple project because 
in order to know that you've got the right root tips, you have to go to the base of the tree and identify a root and follow it all the way out to the end to get the root tips to know which tree it came from and that it wasn't chinkered. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> and the ground was real easy to dig into. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that we did get that work done. It is it's available now. I've I've uh, continued my work, and the latest round of it, uh, and this is a a bold faced plug for a book that I'm about to publish called Ozark Forest Forensics. And the idea is Ozark is to present Ozark Natural History Lessons Illustrated and easy to understand lying drawings. And probably the most important of these is my best effort to reconstruct what Ozark Trinkman looked like in whatever old growth forest we had back in 1955. Uh, these are two logs that I found on a ridge top in the Ozark National Forest in what looked like a typical ridge top, not you know, 60 to 70 foot high, uh, post oak and black oak forest uh, with these tree trunks laying on the ground and uh, in reasonably good shape. So these are the trunks and this is what they look like when I flesh them out and I use as my guide uh, prototypes of the largest living chinkapins that I could find. So basically took these trees and put that kind of branching pattern on them and this is what I came up with. They're about 70 feet high and, uh, prob uh, and certainly were as big or bigger than all the other oak trees that are uh, still on the site today. And notice that both of these trees have little dwarf trees at the base. They have a single upright stem full of bayonet joints and uh, little dwarf trees. And these remnants of these trees at the base will have 20 or 30 growth rings. They aren't a flash in the pan. They're, they're a, a, almost a natural bonsai, and the adaptation, uh, 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 what kind of adaptation that is, is not clear. Why these trees should have those, but, but they're there. So I've got a bunch of other miscellaneous lessons uh, discussing the red oak decline. Uh, this is simply a scene from uh, along the Ozark Highland Trail, showing you a site with at least a dozen dead red oaks, and how and how nicely the forest is recovering. Except for the logs laying there, you never even know that this place has been decimated a decade earlier. Uh, <clears throat> example of some of the uh, other diseases like Phomopsis gall disease that, that can be very striking but doesn't seem to have that much of an effect on the trees. And how to recognize different things that have happened. For example, a lightning strike will cause the steam, the, the <clears throat> sap in a tree to literally explode in the steam explosion versus an ice storm sort of slowly builds the weight up on the tree and they kind of disintegrate and splinter. So I, I, there's a, a whole list of lessons about how you can identify what exactly happened to a tree after the fact. Or you can look at stumps, for example, pines. Pine stumps will rot from the outside in, hardwoods from the inside out, like this uh, elm. And then if you have an oak, the, the rays stick up almost like a bunch of razor blades out of the top of the stump. So a, a whole bunch of lessons like that, but there's a, a more to the trick of the story than that. But my final conclusion is that, that uh, we've established a number of important facts about what chicken was like and, and where it grew. It was widespread and locally abundant in groves. Uh, not really a dominant tree in the forest, but scattered around everywhere and conspicuous enough that you wouldn't miss it. Uh, numerically, it was about 1% of the forest, and the best analogy is white ash. Uh, average density was only about one per hectare, uh, but in groves. So you'd have many hectares without any chinkapin, and then one that would have several dozen. I uh, preferred the top of slopes on tree soil. Seemed to like that not the crest of the ridge and not the mid-slope, but just where the slope starts to break. That seemed to be the place where uh, chinkapins would, would grow. I, best way to describe it was if, if you were back then in the flowering season, you'd see sort of a bathtub ring on the landscape. You're sort of following the tops of the ridges around, just like a bathtub ring. 
Now, Fred, do you think part of that is because of the, um, y'all know, like in farmland, you have the, um, um, the hard pan, and, you know, they'll break that with a chisel plow because it'll keep, it'll, it's not yeah. real permeable to water roots. But then up on the hills, though, we have the frangipan pan up on the very top. I, I don't know. I think that's see, part see, of it, maybe. Preserve that environment. And one thing was interesting was a lot of these areas tended to have no leaf left. And because it, apparently the wind would sweep it clean. So you have these areas that a little bit of exposed turdy gravel, no leaves, lots of moss. We saw a lot of that yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And ticks. Yeah. <laughs> so we predict this. Uh, a self -can canopy to canopy tree with, with spreading crooked form. Uh, the living sprouts loosely cluster around the former seed source. Uh, very few of the big trees ever really re sprouted to remain alive. Uh, most of what we're seeing are what I call old seedlings. They were established as seedlings back in the 1950s, and they just keep on trucking because they're programmed to be able to do that. And uh, tree form is telling us a lot about disturbance history uh, by the fact that they tend to have, have, did tend to have single stems and not multiple stems. So whatever they were going through, they tended not to see much fire or uh, much browse disturbance. So I think, yeah, let's see uh, some of my story. I have a copy. This work was published in 2012. And I can email anybody a copy of the manuscript who wants it. And I can also email a copy of Murad's uh, highly technical discussion of the root tips. And it, his basic conclusion is that there's a much wider array of, of fungal species associated with mycorrhiza and chinkapin than with either oak or chestnut. Uh, for whatever, whatever that amounts to, seems to have a much, much wider range of uh, species. And you have to keep in mind that this, this realm is not well explored. There are lots of unidentified fungal species because there's so many of them and so few people study. And Fred, you didn't, so you didn't bring in your books with you? No, the book has not been published, so I'm, I'm at the galley proof stage. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'm going to say you can run some. I want to buy one. As long as you'll sign out, I'll buy one. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think their chicken pins are so crooked? Uh, I, well, my suspicion is that, you know, trees are generally divided into those with determinate growth and undeterminate growth. So, for example, uh, uh, black locust will continue growing until the stem runs out of gas and then it sort of stops and then the last bud on the stem becomes the new bud. Whereas trees like oaks and maples, they have a bud where their entire new growth is already preformed in there. It's just waiting to expand. And so the bud flushes, and everything that's preformed comes out, and then it forms a new bud, and that's it for the year. Now, they have a thing called lama shoots, where sometimes if the tree is growing so well, it'll decide, well, I can do another flush, and it'll actually, folks will send up a tender new shoot. But for the most part, you know, they, they flush, and that's it. And if you look at chestnut chinkapin, uh, they're sort of opportunists, and they have preformed buds, but often it's not they'll keep on going. <clears throat> so that's why they can grow so fast. And I think the chicken has the problem that they're in, an, uh, in the center of a continent where bad weather can come quickly and unexpectedly. And so they're trying to push the envelope and keep on growing, and they get caught by an early frost. And so the end of the shoot is killed, and then they have to find another bud down below and come up around. That gives you the band. That would be why they have a lot of elbows too on the limbs. Just go straight out and then straight up. Well, the elbows come from the fact that, that it's a very opportunistic tree, and if it's got a lateral branch and suddenly it's getting a lot of light from above, one of the side branches will shoot up. So I, I call those risers. So they tend to make it. Other trees will do that. It's just that that they're such such a vigorous tree that they tend to do it more and better than than. Uh, any of the competitors. Fred, do you think, what, the trees you looked at, what do you think the oldest one was? I mean, it did stump, did it live 100 years? Or? Well, unfortunately, most of the old chinkapins have a, a hollow center. And one question I have is, was it hollow while it was still alive? 
Now, the, the reason that hardwoods uh, rot for me inside out, uh, unlike pines, is that these hardwoods have big vessels, and they call what they call ring porous angiosperms. And these big vessels drain real easy, whereas the hardwood has been plugged with resin, and so it doesn't drain. So what happens is you've got a, a dead log sitting there, the interior holds water, and so it can rot faster. The exterior keeps draining. So these trees are, uh, you know, these trees are hollow, the outside is still intact, the inside is begun to rot away because it's retained water. And so it's hard to tell, you don't have those inner rings. Uh, most of them I looked at, were, <coughs> we only had about 40 years of rings. There was one at Hobbs that was, and I'm sure Al knows where this tree is because somebody propped up, there was a fairly large chink up in there that got bent over in the ice storm and somebody propped it up. And if you look uphill from that, about 20 feet away, it's a chink of its stump, uh, stump standing up about six or seven feet, and then it got broke and fell over. And it was off the ground, and it's intact. And we we took that back to about 1881. That's its starting date. So they uh, they weren't terribly old because they grew so fast. Yes. Oh. How do you recognize the logs when they're lying on the ground other than the form? Do you cut them and look at the wood or just go off the floor? Yeah, you can, you can, when you first get into it, what you can do is, is cut it and it has wood very similar to oak. It's got that same kind of color and large rings, but it doesn't have any rays. So you look for a tree that doesn't have rays and has a kind of reddish color. But if you look at the outer texture of the wood, because it doesn't have rays, it tends to break up into these sinews. And so it's pretty distinctive. Breaks up into what? What I call sinews. Oh, I see. And that, that's very distinctive. And because the wood is so rot resistant, almost nothing grows on it. So instead of moss and lichen, it's pretty bare. Thank you. And then it has a distinctive branching pattern that you can also recognize fairly well. So it, I, my student uh, from Kenya, who had no experience with American trees at all, could I could trust his identification of chicken in one day. <laughs> it's it's that distinctive. Does he want to volunteer? No. Well, he, he might do anything to get out of it. This is next North Dakota winter. Oh, poor. <laughs> because he's uh, I don't know how he held up in Bismarck, but he said he was buying long underwear before he left. <laughs> Where do you hope to have the book available? How soon? I don't know. I, to be honest, this was supposed to be published by the University of Arkansas Press and, and sponsored by the Ozark Foundation. Oh. And the University Press fired everybody and subcontracted all of their doings to the University of Chicago, which does not market in the Ozarks. And so the problem is coming up with an alternative outlet because we, you know, this book obviously has to be marketed here in this region and not sold out of the University of Chicago catalog.